So uh, the first thing I want to talk about this evening are a couple of assignments that are coming up. And the, the first assignment is project one, and it will be due on March 25th. And for this assignment, what you are to do is you are to list the federal entitlements that your school receives. Now, more than likely, your school receives Title I funds, pretty common. They, they probably receive special education funds, pretty common. Uh, they also receive national uh, school lunch monies, pretty common. Now, what you'll do is list those and you would, you would tell me uh, what those are for. You'll tell me what, and we'll, we'll get into those uh, more later to, uh, this evening. But so you'll list the various entitlements that you receive and you're not gonna receive all of them. You're gonna receive some of them. And then the second thing you'll do is you will uh, tell me what those monies are to be used for. Uh, then in a paragraph or two, tell me uh, the where you discovered this. How did you get this information? Where did you get this information? Now, I'm going to give you an idea on where to get this information uh, in a minute uh, when I talk about the next assignment. Uh, so you'll tell me where you got this information, and then why is this an understanding of this information important to you, okay? Why is understanding Title I, for example, important to you? Why is understanding the lunch program important to you? Uh, and so that is uh, the Project One pretty straightforward. Uh, and also, I doubt if any of you, your schools have competitive, federal competitive grants, but if you do, you will list those. Uh, if you don't have any, just say none, and I'll get that and, and uh, completely understand that. Uh, so the, the next uh, questions on that particular assignment. Okay. Whoops here. I got to change my mouse. <laughs> Darn mice. Okay, so the next assignment will be, you're gonna be doing an interview. And uh, this interview, you might wanna include in your portfolio. Uh, it is not due until April 26th. However, my suggestion is you interview your supervisor or your principal, whoever has the most knowledge about the funding of your school. Because what we want you to, to talk about in this interview is we with them is we want you to talk about the budget process. So it's the beginning of that culminating assignment, which is the budget development. You'll then also talk about the, the revenue. Where does the funds come from? Where, you know, what specific uh, monies are the funding coming from? Uh, and so, uh, from there, you will also uh, indicate uh, the expenditures. So you'll be starting to get a feeling for that budget process, the specific revenue for your school, and the specific expenses for your school. And later in the course, you'll be learning about that. You'll be learning the specific terms, such as capital outlay, uh, which is equipment, uh, of course you know, personnel expenditures or personnel uh, salaries is just that. So, you know, that's the, that uh, interview will not, will not be due until April 26th, and it will start you down the road to the development of the budget, okay? Hi, Angela, how you doing? Questions about those two projects? And once again, we are recording, so you'll have a chance to, uh, review that if you need, okay? Are these the only two projects left that we have? For no, this no okay. you, you have a, a project two, and uh, in project two, we get into expenditures, specific expenditures. Uh, and then of course the budget development, the, the, the putting together of the budget. And I was so disappointed because for some odd reason, Blackboard would not allow me to upload the documents that you need. So I have to remember to email those to you. Uh, and so sometime probably a month or, or so, probably in around April 1st, I suppose, 
I will probably uh, email those to you so you'll have those. And of course, we can talk about that at the, at the next session. Okay, so now let's get into the uh, content for federal funding, uh, federal revenue. Uh, and the first uh, objective is for the students to acknowledge the average federal government percentage of the district revenue that comes through the federal government. Can somebody give me a guess on that? Well, it's about 8% for most school districts, about 8%. Uh, and uh, so about 45% is state funded in public schools, about 40 some percent is uh, local funding, it's a little bit less than state funding, and then uh, federal funding comes in uh, dead la way dead last. Uh, and so it's important that you realize that the federal government uh, is not obligated, as we have learned previously, to fund education. Uh, they got involved in it uh, with the Eisenhower grant, but uh, they, they, they just don't haven't made a serious commitment to it to education, although there's a lot of lots of lip service that politicians give. Okay, the the next objective is to recall the top three federal revenue sources. So where does the federal government get it get its money? Where does it get its money? Anybody want to jump out there and guess? Is income tax one of them? Absolutely, absolutely. Personal income tax, by and large the largest uh, provider of federal income. The second one is payroll tax. Now, payroll tax is kind of interesting because you folks pay for Social Security in your payroll. I receive Social Security, so thank you very much. <laughs> but Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment insurance, that is the second provider of income for the federal government, although they also are spending that money as well. In fact, they're probably spending it faster than they're receiving it to some degree. The third uh, is corporate income tax, corporate income tax. Uh, excise tax, uh, an excise tax is a restricted tax. So excise taxes, for example, when you go to fill up your car, if you have a Gas, uh, gasoline fueled car, you are paying not only state tax, you're paying federal tax. And if you ever look at if you ever look at the uh, the stamp, you're going to be astonished at how much the taxes are as compared to the actual cost that you're paying for the fuel. Uh, and so, but those excise taxes that are received are restricted. They're only used for highway. Uh, uh, development and, and bridges and things such as that. So that would be the case. The, the next thing is to recall the expenditures. Well, we already mentioned, Social Security is the largest expenditure for the state, uh, for the federal government. 34% of funds coming in go toward Social Security. 24% is for Medicare. And these are mandatory expenses for the government. If you qualify for Social Security, you receive it. If you qualify for Medicare, you receive it. And they have, of course, uh, the, the manner in which you will receive those monies. Defense, or the military, is the third largest expenditure. Education, 2%. 2% of the federal government the, the, the federal revenue goes towards education. So it is a very, very meager uh, expenditure. And that comes through this, the discretionary budget. So with the federal government, there are two budgets. There's a mandatory budget and there is a discretionary budget. Now you just heard recently that, the, that Congress kicked the can down the road. We were out of money and they had to extend the uh, debt limit in order to continue to keep the services available. And that's been going on for years and years and years. Uh, so 
personal income tax, the uh, biggest income producer for the federal government, Social Security, the biggest expenditure for the, uh, for the, social, for the uh, federal government. Expen uh, education, very, very meager. Uh, the, the third objective is to identify the federal fiscal year. Can someone tell me what the federal fiscal year is and, and tell me what the fiscal year is, period? What's fiscal year mean? So October 1st to September 30th, right? Correct. Same as Michigan, by the way. Right. And, and of course, the fiscal year is the business year. Same. Now, uh, you'll find this, you might find this a little bit interesting. In Ohio, the uh, fiscal year runs from June 1st to July or June, June, July, June 1st through May 30th. Thir yeah, May 30th. So what that means is for uh, Ohio districts, they haven't got the federal money yet. And so they have to project what how much money they're gonna get from the federal government. They do what's called a temporary appropriation. And then when the federal money comes in, in uh, in October, then they can they they create a permanent appropriation. You don't have to do that in Michigan. That's a it's a definite benefit uh, for you folks in Michigan. Okay, so now just like we did for the state government, what is the federal annual discretionary budgetary process? Now, key, I said annual. If you can imagine the trillions of dollars that the government takes. And they are doing a annual budget every year. And they have to have it done by October 1st. Okay. So can someone uh, give me a, a, a little bit of a, uh, the details of, of that budget process? Okay. Would it be like with getting the student count from schools on count day? Is that what you're talking about? And then they count. Yeah, of course, of course, with the federal government, count day doesn't matter. Okay. The, there's no such thing as count day. Now you do do a count for special education students for the federal government, but there's no count day. Uh, so what we're talking about here is how the federal government goes about deciding the discretionary budget how much they're gonna spend on those discretionary education in particular. So it starts off with, uh, for example, the Department of Education provides uh, the uh, Office of Budget and Management their requests for monies. And typically they always ask for more than they got the year previously. And they, they make sure they spend all the money that they were given from the year previously. So that starts the process. Then the pres president, just like the governor, then proposes a budget to Congress. Now, once again, the president themselves, they don't do that. All the work is done primarily by the Office of Budget Management and all those individuals. Uh, obviously, the president, the president's cabinet, they have input into the kinds of things that they want to see funded. Uh, for example, uh, years back, we had No Child Left Behind, and that was a Bush initiative. And so consequently, the, uh, the president, Bush, said, I want money for No Child Left Behind. And so th therefore, that was built within that budget that went to Congress. So that from there, just like the state, you have congressional deliberations uh, in the Senate and in the House. And ultimately, there is a joint consensus of those two uh, government bodies and there is a budget put together. That budget then goes to the president uh, for their signature and if it is signed it becomes law and that budget then is turned into an appropriation which then becomes uh, the ability to spend those monies uh, in that budget. Of course it finalizes with reviews and audits. There are reviews and audits. And 
when, when we get into the accounting side, uh, I think it's module 13 or 14, you're gonna find out the auditing process, okay? Um, the, the fifth objective is to explain the funding distribution in which traditional non-public and public charter schools receive the federal funds. Well, how's that, what's that? And this is an important process. You really should understand this process. Okay, so to start the process, the State Department of Education applies to the federal government, to the Department of Education, Federal Department of Education, for the various entitlements that they will qualify for. The federal government reviews those applications, and if they are approved, they then forward that money to the state Department of Education. The state department, and, and, and the money is uh, decided by formula. All the entitlements are also, would be considered to be a formula grant. They have a specific way in which they are going to be deciding how much money a state receives. And oftentimes it's based on the number of students in the state or the number of um, low income families in the state. Uh, so when the state receives that money, the public school applies for those grants, those grant monies. And the State Department of Education reviews those grants, approve them, and send those monies to the state, or excuse me, to the traditional uh, public education, okay? From there, for parochial schools, they work in conjunction with the public school to receive the their allocation of monies. So uh, very quickly, state application to the federal government, federal government to the state department of education, uh, local public schools apply for the money to the state. And then the parochial school requests the money that they are entitled to from the public school. Okay. Uh, so very important uh, that you have an understanding of that process. Okay. So now we're going to, to kind of go uh, item by item of the various entitlements. Now, can someone tell me what an entitlement is? And once again, entitlement and formula grant are, means the same thing. What's, what's an entitlement? Kathleen, you want to jump out there? No? Well, an entitlement means that you are, if you have certain criteria, you will receive these monies automatically. You will receive these monies. And the monies will be, be given to you by, for, by a formula. There'll be a formula. There's a formula for each one of these uh, various uh, grants. The one that you probably are most familiar with is Title I. And I know that within your discussion board, you talked about Title I. And it's Title I, actually it's called Title I Part A. Can someone tell me what Title I monies are for? School resources. Okay. What specifically? Um, Was there there's there are specific resources. Oh yeah. Um for like what's that? Um like act uh extra teachers or tutors. You can you, you, those are allowable expenses, yes. Reading so would it be for the curriculum or because I know at our school it's a title one and they get all the supplies. The school supplies are a part of okay. it being a title one. But I don't know if it's so within the Title I program, uh, if, it, if it's a regular Title I program, the funding comes to the, to the state based on the number of low-income families in the state. And when there are more uh, low-income families, you receive, the state receives more money. And the same thing is true within the uh, school district. They receive monies based on the number of low-income 
families in, the, in their district. However, the services, which are typically for reading and math, reading and math intervention, they may be used for any student, regardless of that family's income, if they are considered to be deficient based on local testing. So therefore, uh, the, the Title I money is specifically used for supporting children who need extra help in reading and mathematics. Typically, it is in the elementary schools. Some may be in the middle school, fewer in the high schools. Typically, that's the way it is, uh, is decided. Now, once again, so based on the number of individuals in a parochial school that needs intervention, they will receive the allocation, this per student allocation for those monies. Every, every entitlement has allowable expenses. Typically your allowable expenses are things like teacher salaries, teacher benefits, classroom supplies, classroom equipment, all of those kinds of things. Now, there's one little twist on this, and that is if a school is classified as school-wide, a school-wide Title I program. Has anyone ever heard of school-wide Title I program? So a, a school, if, if there's a certain number of children in the total school, and I don't know the exact number, but let's just say that, that the, the threshold, eligibility threshold is 40%. If, if, if a school has 40% of the families in the low income bracket, they can apply for a school-wide grant, Title I grant, meaning that the whole school can use those funds for still for math and reading interventions, okay? So they can't use them for phys ed. You can't use them for phys ed. You, can, you, you have to use them for, for reading and for uh, math. Okay, so that's Title I, Part A. The next one is Title I, Part C. Title I, Part C. And this one is probably uh, being used more than in the past because it is for the education of migratory children, migratory children. And so the number of migrant children that you have in your school district, if you have the threshold of percentages, you can qualify and receive Title I Part C. Now, I here's where you're going to have to talk to your principal. Your school may not receive that money. You might not have enough migrant children. Now, what's additionally interesting, federal law requires school districts to educate migrant, all migrant children, homeless children and migrant children. You can't refuse education to them. You have to provide for them. Uh, so if you were in a school in Texas, you probably would receive Title I Part C money. Okay, but uh, knowing that the migrant issue is now more national, there could be additional uh, school districts and states that are qualifying for that. So that one is uh, Title I Part C. Oh, and, and by the way, I don't expect you to know the, the formulas. Uh, they're very complex. And, and although in, in this one, the, the money is based on the number of migrant children. If you have a large number of migrant children, you receive more money than a school district that has fewer migrant children, okay? So Title IIA, and this is for supporting effective instruction. And the funds are used to provide high quality teachers for low income families. Now, some of your schools might receive Title II money. And once again, that should be a question that you wanna ask your principal uh, or your supervisor, do you, do we receive Title II money, okay? 
Title three, part A is English language acquisition, language enhancement and academic achievement program. And these monies are used to support English as a second language students. And the idea is to help them uh, reach the same achievement level as uh, the traditional students. And once again, population uh, factor is the uh, deciding determination. So a school district could receive Title III Part A money for education and second language program, as well as uh, Title I Part C, education for migratory children. You could receive both of those monies. Okay, so once again, if you have a, a high number of uh, English uh, second as a second language learners, then you might receive those monies. Okay, uh, the, the, the next ones are a little less known. I am going to run through them uh, kind of quickly uh, because I want you to just hear them. Uh, you, you probably aren't going to, I'm not going to ask you about them, but uh, Title IV Part A. And this is student support and academic enrichment. This is for gifted children, funding to strengthen student learning. Title IV Part A is also uh, the 21st century learning communities. And states apply for those monies. Uh, Title V Part B, rural education. So it funds the unique needs of rural schools. Uh, Title VI, Indian education formula grants. If you have a high number of American Indians or native Alaskans, you can qualify or you will qualify for Indian education uh, monies. Now, once again, probably not in your district. There probably isn't a large number of native Alaskans, uh, maybe zero. There might be some American Indians, uh, but probably not enough to warrant. Once again, the number is the, the population is the, the key. But if you go out west, there's a number of schools uh, in, in Arizona and Oklahoma that have large uh, contingency of American Indians and they would then qualify. Uh, Title seven is called impact aid. And this is uh, used uh, to financially uh, help schools from the burden of federal requirements, okay? Uh, Title Seven, Subtitle B, this is for homeless children. Now, if you are in Detroit, for example, more than likely you would qualify for that particular grant because there probably are a number of homeless children. And what's interesting is uh, having familiarity with that particular grant, uh, the, the child doesn't necessarily have to be living under a bridge, for example. The homeless uh, criteria is kind of broad. For example, uh, and I can't do the criteria off the top of my head, but if, if a student lives with a family of like five different families, that kid could be very well considered homeless. Uh, and so anyway, now we get into the uh, another very important one and one that I would guess every one of your schools probably qualify for, and that is uh, part B, Section 611, and that is the education for school-aged children with disabilities. So I can't remember, I think it's in October or maybe December, I think it may be December. In December, there's a child count of special education children. And based on that child count, you send it to the state, the state uses those, those numbers, applies to the federal government for their allocation, and then they receive those back. And once again, uh, we learned that from the state formula, Michigan state formula, you only fund two disabilities. Well, the federal government only funds one disability. So if a child is very involved, it doesn't matter to the federal government, you're only gonna get X number of dollars. It used to be around $600 per child. That's what the federal government was giving. Uh, part B, section 619 is preschool grants preschool grants. Uh, and Lenise, you, you very well might qualify for uh, preschool grants. I'm not sure about that, but you very well could. The next one, a very, very popular, been around since the 1930s, and that's the National School Lunch Program. 
Now, the thing that people don't under, don't understand is that you would think most all of these grants come through the Department of Education, of course. However, not the school lunch program. The school lunch program comes under the Department of Agriculture. And it primarily was brought about to help save the farming industry in the 1930s. They were going through some difficult times uh, and this provided a, a resource uh, for their goods and services. Uh, the next one is specifically for career technical education, vocational schools, uh, and that's called the Perkins Basic Grant. The next one is E-Grant. And once, and once again, my guess is every one of your school districts qualify for E-Grants. Uh, and these are discounts for connectivity, internet. And you can, uh, you receive a discount based on your school district's wealth, wealth factor. And it could be a discount of as high as 90% or as low as 20%. And so therefore uh, that has made the difference. Uh, the last one of these is called the school-based Medicare program. And uh, this is another one that oftentimes schools don't realize and particularly parochial schools don't realize they will qualify for this. So if a child has specific health needs, you document the amount of time that the nurse spends, you document the amount of time that various, there are various uh, services that are services, health services that are provided. And you submit that information to actually the state government. However, it is, fe it is federally funded. So the monies come from the federal government to the state and then to the to the local school districts. Uh, do any of you do, do any of you document any of your health issues? I don't in my classroom. I, I've never had an issue that I had to document. Okay. Uh, so you know, once again, oh, this one here is uh, when when school districts discovered they could do this. I mean, it's kind of difficult to keep track of all the documentation, but when school districts discovered that they were eligible for these monies, they became, became much more aggressive in applying for those monies. Uh, and it is one that people don't realize uh, is available. One you heard of that's come and gone is the CARES funding. And CARES funding was due to COVID. And this was a one-time entitlement uh, where the allotment was based on the Title I formula, uh, and it was to help school districts recover from the issues um, put together by or caused by the closing of the school and COVID and all those kinds of things. So uh, it, once again, just, to, just to, to recap, the most important ones I want to make sure that you have heard is Title I Part A. Make sure you are very well aware of that one. Uh, part, part B, Section 611, Education School Age Children. Part B, Section 619, Preschool. This National Lunch Program, E-Rate. Those are the ones I want you to make sure that you are familiar with. And when you talk with your principal, ask specifically, do we receive E-Rate funds? They should be able to answer that off the top of their head. Do we receive federal money for special education children? Once again, they should be able to answer that. Do we receive money for our school lunch and breakfast programs? Do we receive Title I monies? Okay. So from there, uh, if you if you have a so once again for this assignment, project one. You just list the various entitlements that you receive, what those entitlements are for, how you learned about this information, and why do you think it's important to know about E-rate, about the various um, entitlements. So from there, the next thing that we want you to be aware of is to define, recognize, and explain federal discretionary grants. 
in that process. Now, as soon as we say discretionary, that means competitive. So uh, in this, and you would just, I am I am just flabbergasted at the kinds of things that the federal government does in fact provide uh, discretionary funding for. Now, the problem is these applications are quite challenging. And typically you have to have a uh, group of individuals working together. You have to have very elaborate evaluation mechanisms. You have to have that all spelled out very specifically. Uh, and the uh, these competitive grants can come up at various times. There probably are ones that are coming up on April 1st. And the enrollment or application period is from April 1st until April 30th. And if you miss that enrollment time, you can't apply. Uh, you know, to be honest, as long as I've been in education, I have yet to be associated with a federal approved federal grant. I've been involved with a, attempts. Uh, we, we worked with a number of other school districts in an attempt to receive federal monies, but we never received it, uh, received those. So uh, those are available. And, and the uh, warehouse where you can find all this is on grants.gov. So if you went on grants.gov, it would list all of the federal in, uh, competitive grants that are available and not just uh, education, not just uh, the Department of Education. Uh, there, there could be uh, things that you could qualify for that would be from other departments, Department of Agriculture, for example, uh, Car Department of Commerce, if for working with uh, business kinds of things. So anyway, discretionary grants. Federal funding comes in two sources. Either they are entitlements, which is you're entitled if you meet the threshold, or discretionary. You apply and you are, your application is reviewed and determined whether you meet the expectations or not, okay? The last thing we wanna do is kind of review uh, some terms, uh, the terminologies. Uh, the term local education agency, LEA. Does anyone know what LEA is? That's the school district, the school district. So within the grant application, if they use the term LEA or local uh, education agency, they're talking about the school district as opposed to the SEA. That's the state education agency, SEA. The state education or state education agency is the state department of education. So once again, uh, if they say the SEA must submit their Title I application by X date. And here's the, here's the application uh, to complete. They must fulfill it by that particular time. The SEA would send it to the Federal Department of Education. It would get reviewed, uh, probably get approved, and then monies would be eventually uh, re received by the school district, the LEAs. Allowable expenses. Every one of these uh, different uh, grants have allowable expenses. Now, typically they are fairly broad based. Typically salaries are included, uh, pe uh, benefits are included, supplies are included. On occasion, you can get equipment, computers on occasion, not always, but on occasion. Uh, so we want you to realize that. Uh, supplant. This is an extremely important concept. So the school district in using federal money, entitlement money, you may not, make sure you hear that, may not use federal money to replace something that you are currently funding. I had an example. I was, my school district was going through uh, extreme financial difficulty. We were a poor school district, low income school district. Therefore, quite honestly, we were federal funded rich, but we were poor state and local funding. So I had a school nurse. The school nurse had been 
totally funded by the school district. I decided as the superintendent that we were going to use federal monies and, and, and specifically we used drug free, they had a drug free grant. We were going to use drug free grant monies because the nurse worked with drug kinds of related issues. What I but we couldn't supplant her salary. So what I did was we and I, I, I first told the union, I said, look, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be making a recommendation to the Board of Education that we reduce the school nurse by 0.6 FTE full time equipment 1.0 was the, the full nurse. We're gonna reduce it by 0.6, 60%, but we're gonna turn around and we're going to re-employ her 60% using federal money. So in essence, we really did supplant, but on paper, we did not supplant because we reduced her and then we hired her back uh, and so we would, didn't supplant the use of uh, money. Uh, sometimes you got to get creative when your school district is um, fifty percent uh, in the red. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we did uh, in order to help the district get back into good financial shape. So I know I went through those entitlements fairly quickly. Once again, uh, make sure that you spend some time knowing those major ones that we were talking about. If you if you know those major ones, you'll you'll be fine, okay? Questions. Fifty one minutes, not bad. I like to keep these within an hour. <laughs> well, you know, overall, I'm very happy with the way that the quizzes. You're you're doing good on the quizzes. I think the I feel uh, very good about the uh, YouTube video um, because I think that really helps you. And you know, the one thing that I'm, I, and I don't know how to work, I, I've, I've given this lots of thought. I don't like the fact that we have the review one week before your quiz. There just seems to be a little bit too much time there. And also the their thing that that causes is I know that you have not uh, reviewed the content as much as I would have liked for you to have reviewed before we have these review sessions. But I just haven't figured out if, if this class met on Thursday, <laughs> later in the week, uh, we'd be we'd be better served. I think I'd be, we'd be able to do this better. Uh, and next year, I think when I teach this, I'm gonna ask, the, uh, ask about having the review session maybe midweek uh, prior to the, uh, the Monday quiz. Anyway, at this point, we'll keep on uh, doing it the way we're doing it. Any other questions? Well, have a good evening and good luck on your quiz. You. Okay, you take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.